Hi, uh, welcome everybody to uh, our latest Cavalry Conversation. The point of the Cavalry Conversations is to get uh, science journalists and scientists and people who care about science and people who care about science communication together in the same room and to figure out how we can do it better. Uh, as always, we're grateful to the Cavalry Foundation for making it possible. Um, my name is Dan Fagan, and I'm the director of the Science, Health, and Environmental Reporting Program here at the Carter Institute of Journalism at NYU. And I also run something called the Science Communication Workshops, which are for PhD scientists and postdocs and med students uh, here at NYU. We offer them workshops to try to make them uh, better science communicators. So all that fits in with our, our general effort to uh, figure out how we can bring science to its rightful place in, the, in this democracy with all its problems. Uh, tonight, uh, we're gonna be talking about physics, a subject that scares many people, including me, uh, but that I'm insanely curious about and am looking forward to learning much more. Uh, Lee uh, will properly introduce our guests uh, Sabina Hassenfelder and uh, uh, Natalie Wolkover, Wolchover, excuse me, but actually that's wrong too, but Natalie will correct us all. <laughs> uh, but I just wanted to say thank you to both of them. Uh, Sabina came all the way from Germany and Natalie came all the way from uptown. Uh, <laughs> so thank you both. Uh, and as ever, I will throw it now to uh, Robert Lee Holtz, distinguished writer in residence here at the Carter Institute and a science writer for the Wall Street Journal and our uh, uber-talented uh, moderator for these events. So take it away, Lee. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So welcome to the Cavalry Conversations on Science Communication. Now, our idea, as some of you already know, is to bring together a leading researcher and an esteemed science journalist to explore how best to bring the general public into the community of discovery. These conversations are sponsored by the Cavalry Foundation and by the NYU Science, Health, and Environmental Reporting Program under the directorship of uh, Professor Dan Fagan. Now, we're just past midstream in our fall series, and just looking ahead for a minute, in two weeks on November 30th, uh, we'll be confronting the latest controversy over climate change and the media with noted climatologist and author Michael Mann from Penn State and journalist uh, David Wallace Wells, who was deputy editor of New York Magazine. Now, I should say as an aside, you know, there are heroes in the world and there are heroes in science. And for his dogged defense of sci uh, scientific understanding of climate change in the face of lawsuits, of congressional pressure, of uh, state subpoenas and sustained and quite bitter political attack, I have to say that Michael Mann is one of those heroes. And I urge you to come and hear what he has to say is well worth your time. Our central focus, always, is how to convey complex research to the general public. For our Cavalry conversation tonight, we'll turn to physics science journalism and the proper role of scientists in communications and all the twists and turns of conveying new research to the public. I want to say this is a conversation, not a lecture. So interrupt us, please, with your questions from the microphone. Those of you who are watching online, please tweet us using the hashtag CavaliConvo and we'll get your questions on the front of us as well. So look, let's get to the meat of it. Every day, we make choices as science journalists about what to cover and about what we think we can safely ignore. I mean, who really knows why? From moment to moment, we call it news judgment. But there's a cumulative effect. Over time, some fields of research receive a disproportionate share of public attention, while others never quite shine so brightly in the public eye. Regardless of their relative importance in the actual scheme of things. So tonight, 
we're going to talk about and consider some of those choices. Now, what do I mean? So in lieu of actual data, uh, coverage of research topics and our ability to generate public interest in them, I of course turn to that very precise yardstick of public attention, Google. <laughs> so artificial intelligence, 119 million hits. Gene editing, 105 million hits. Ebola, 32 million hits. Climate change denial, 28 million hits. Dinosaur extinction, 21.3 million hits. Gravitational waves, a physics topic that was hailed as the discovery of the century and perhaps the most expensive and sophisticated experiment in the history of contemporary science, which won the three who laid the groundwork for it earlier this year, the Nobel Prize in Physics. 759,000 hits. Public attention tilts, apparently, so does science journalism. We need to talk about this, because we're here to do this better. We're here with theoretical physicist, Sabina Hosenfelder, who joins us from Germany. She's a little jet lagged, but I thank her for uh, keeping her eyes open. And there she's based at the Frankfurt Institute of, for Advanced Studies. Um, her field is physics beyond the standard model. Uh, phenomenology, I can't even say it. Phenomenological <laughs> quantum gravity and modifications of general relativity. She's the editor of a new book on her field, Experimental Search for Quantum Gravity, which was published earlier this year. But in her free time, uh, she also writes a popular physics blog called Back Reaction. She writes for Forbes, Aeon, Nova, Nautilus, among others. You may not know this, but she also sings about physics. Uh, and I highly recommend her ballads about Schrodinger's cat <laughs> and string theory, which are um, easy to find on YouTube. I know you won't thank me for that, but <laughs> <laughs> it's, worth a, it's worth a listen. It's worth a listen. Um, and, you know, not only a uh, song, but lately she's turned as a communications device also to animation. Um, it's unusual outreach for a working scientist. And next June, her new book for the general public uh, is coming out called Lost in Math, uh, How Beauty Leads Physics Astray, which um, she worries may cost her a bid for tenure. <laughs> and we're joined by Natalie Wolchover. Uh, senior writer who covers physics at Quanta magazine. Her we work has been featured in the best writing on mathematics in 2015, and she's the, winter, uh, the winner of the 2016 Communications Award for her articles, uh, her article in Quanta on the looming dead end for particle physics, quote, what no new particles mean for physics, which appeared uh, in Quanta. And she's uh, happy there to tackle the specter of the infamous die photon bump and even more curiously, the diphoton hangover. She's written for Popular Science, Live Science, and other uh, publications. Although not a working scientist, um, she did major in physics as an undergraduate at Tufts University, and she studied graduate level physics at the University of California at Berkeley, and has co-authored several academic papers in nonlinear optics. But in the course of a single sleepless night, she turned her back on research and decided to become a science writer. <coughs> Natalie, you dropped out the next day. What went bump in the night? <laughs> um, yeah, it's still kind of a mystery to me, actually, uh, why I went through such a radical transformation over the course of that night in terms of my whole future plan. Um, but I just realized that science writing would be the perfect way to combine um, long-standing interests both in physics and in, um, in writing and uh, reading and writing, which, you know, at being at Berkeley, I had left behind some of my literary interests. And um, I think that night it just finally uh, kind of became clear that I was missing that in my, in my life. And, that this would be the way to combine them. And I was so sure that it would be uh, a good 
uh, a great career and that I would succeed in it. I, I think I didn't know like how much, how, how hard it is to become a science writer, that it's maybe equally hard as becoming a, a scientist. So I just decided I can do that. And yeah, the next day I dropped out of Berkeley and that was that. And then what? Um, so I started a blog, uh, which I really think was um, just the best decision because uh, I every day wrote on the blog and um, really just practiced writing because I hadn't done a lot of uh, science writing, hardly any science writing. So, uh, but I made it just a routine that I had to write a post every day. Um, and then to make money, I tutored undergrad physics students and stayed in Berkeley doing that because I already knew the course material. I had been TAing. So um, yeah, and then so I was blogging and, and tutoring and then pitching stories to magazines and uh, applying for internships and then eventually got an internship and mm -hmm. things progressed from there. So mm. it worked out okay. Mm. But I think everyone thought it was just crazy. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was. Sabina, yeah. now you stuck it out. Um, you, you stayed in school, you did your dissertation, you've uh, carved yourself out a, a, a distinguished niche as a, as a physicist, but you know, only later um, you turn to what I've heard at least one of your colleagues refer to as the dark side, <laughs> which is making the effort to talk to us. Uh, not just about your own work as a, as a matter of self-promotion, but rather about sort of the state of physics in general and things that, that uh, concern you. And I'm kind of wondering, why? <laughs> <laughs> because I felt that someone has to do it. So um, I think my story is very different from yours. So I uh, ended up in this by accident, I would say. So I, um, I made my... PhD in uh, Germany and then I uh, moved to the States and I had a lot of friends and um, family and uh, colleagues who would call to ask me how's it over there <laughs> are, are they as crazy as we're told they are <laughs> and um, it was I, you know I would tell them stories uh, but I would have to tell them 20 times <laughs> because everyone would ask the same thing. And at some point, I figured that it would be easier if I would write it up and put it on a blog so that all of them could read it and I would be done with it. <laughs> and <laughs> I did this for a while. Um, but from the people who it was meant for, none of them re read it. Uh, instead, I <laughs> got other people asking me, you know, you're a physicist, what is it that you're actually doing? And then I noticed that people are actually interested in what a theoretical physicist does and what that entails, this job, how it's going, um, what you actually do. And so I started to write less about uh, my personal life and more about my research and other people's research and um, how it's done in practice. And that's how I ended up in this. I think you're selling yourself short. Now, many of you may not know, you, uh, several years ago, engaged in, the, in a curious and interesting piece of outreach. You offered uh, on your blog for $50, if anyone had like some serious physics questions they wanted answered, they could contact you and you would sit down with them or Skype with them and you'd go through it. I mean, how did that work and why did you do that? That does not seem like a... Uh, well, that's a, that's a fairly recent thing. Yeah? And there's an obvious reason for why I started it. It was that I was running out of money. <laughs> and so my my, my job ended, and I had a I had a new contract coming in, but there was a break by several months between them, and so I was you know brainstorming, trying to figure out what can you do uh, with a PhD in theoretical physics, specialization in quantum gravity that anyone might be interested in paying money for. Uh, and then I put up this uh, note on my blog that says, uh, you, you can ask me questions about uh, physics and I will do my best to answer them and here's the rate. And interestingly enough, um, I got requests for it. Yeah? And yeah, it was interesting. <laughs> would you like to expand <laughs> on interesting? <laughs> um, I, well, I cannot say that I learned a lot about physics 
Uh, but what I certainly learned along the way is that there are a lot of people who are very enthusiastic about theoretical physics um, to the point that they spend a huge amount of time developing their own theories and they really, really want to understand uh, what's going on and there's also a lot of frustration because it's very hard to figure out what professional um, physicists are actually doing if you do not have um, the, the background that you get from um, the usual education by making your um, master's <coughs> and uh, PhD. So it's very hard to, uh, to get into this um, from the side, so to say, at, at a later level. It's basically impossible. And uh, so what people end up with is a very vague understanding that they get from uh, reading the popular science literature um, and um, a lot of them don't even realize how much it is that they are not understanding. So most of what I do when I talk to them is that I try to tell them, well, this idea that, that uh, you have come up with, um, it um, relates to this and this and this and this research area, and here are the keywords, and there are some uh, rivioticals or low-level entry mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. drugs, so to say, you know, yeah, where, see, where you I can see. start reading into this and, and then try to get it to mm -hmm. the literature. Now, do you feel an obligation as a scientist to sort of conduct these kinds of conversations mm -hmm. with the public, or do you just um, have too much free time? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm actually, since I now have a job that I have to work on full time, I'm not uh, doing it uh, all that often. Uh, what I've uh, done after my new contract started was that I put out a note on Facebook and I asked for people with a PhD in physics who might be interested uh, in doing this. So now I have a group of um, seven, eight people um, who I refer mm -hmm. um, the, mm -hmm. the callers to. Yeah. I mean, I think the point here is, I mean, not just that you're a, uh, a person of, of apparently infinite patience, um, but that there is a kind of untapped um, appetite for Definitely. engagement with uh, this subject. And uh, Natalie, if I may um, turn to you for a second, I mean, the whole reason that Quanta, for the magazine for which you write, um, funded by the Simons Foundation, the whole reason that that magazine exists, if I read the mission statement correctly is because those of us in the, for lack of a word, better word, I'll call the mainstream media, legacy <laughs> media, whatever, do such an absolutely awful job of communicating, writing about, covering um, physics and mathematics that there is a vacuum here that quanta needs to fill. Am I, am I wrong about that? What is, what is quanta well, growing yeah, out I, of? I, I, mean, I don't think we would put it that way or put no, it so I put it that about way. It. Yeah, but, uh, but yeah, I think uh, there was a sense that when the mainstream media does cover physics and math, um, they're covering stories that they think are somehow relevant to people's daily life or, you know, like, oh, physicists figured out why uh, it's better to run in the rain rather than walk in the rain because you'll get less wet or these kinds of it's kind of silly stories a lot of the time that um, editors think will appeal to people <coughs> instead of the stories that are actually really important um, or the, the discoveries or research that's actually really important in physics and math um, and these other areas that we cover. So I think there was this idea that, um, or this hope that the public actually does have an interest in knowing what's going on at the very cutting edge of, of physics um, and that we would uh, have an audience once we started telling those stories and I think it very quickly became clear that that was true. Um, and so, yeah, so, so it kind of worked out. Um, does that answer your question? That's a good start. Yeah. <laughs> so Quanta, for mm -hmm. those of you who don't know, it's online. Um, and it's founded by, uh, or funded um, by uh, the Simons Foundation, which is a very well uh, uh, endowed foundation by um, the fellow uh, who uh, ran a, still does I guess, ran a uh, very successful, one of the most successful hedge funds um, called Renaissance, uh, the Renaissance Fund I guess. And uh, of course the essence of hedge funds, the essence of Wall Street, the essence of these immense fortunes that dominate our age, is of course like a, an appreciation for mathematics in some of the stranger um, corners of, uh, 
of uh, computational physics and such. But what yeah. I'm wondering now is, so who are your readers? I mean, it's a, uh, it's a foundation-based magazine. It's not a print publication. It doesn't yeah. get distributed. Mm -hmm. Who gets to it? Yeah, I mean, I think we, uh, you know, we only, we don't completely know who our readers are, but um, it seems to be a lot of people who are in uh, technical areas maybe, but applied areas. So m maybe they got a PhD or uh, at least an undergraduate degree in a technical field, but now they're working as a software engineer or uh, who knows, something like that, even IT or something um, that doesn't really, that uses their uh, quantitative abilities but doesn't really satisfy their interest in, in science. Um, and so I think that's a huge percentage of, you know, of, of the readership. Um, but then there's also lay people who are just interested um, and then scientists as well. I think we have a lot of scientist readers and we found that um, you can kind of write a story uh, the same way, whether it's directed at a lay person or a scientist when it's not their exact area of expertise. Mm -hmm. So if it's even one step away from something um, that they actually study, they need it to be just as kind of um, simplified or, or lacking in jargon. Mm -hmm. um, simplified is not what we do, but um, no, I'll say. clear as it is when a lay person is reading it. So we, we appeal to a broad spectrum of readers. So, so but you have metrics. So, so yeah. Uh, give me your uniques or however you like to quantify yeah. the number of virtual uh, eyeballs that you're attracting. Sure. Well, I would say I don't really follow that so much and I don't have to. And that's kind of a nice thing about Quant is we try not to base our decisions on, you know, what has, has attracted a lot of readers in the past or, um, you know, what kinds of uh, topics our readers seem to like. Like we, we kind of try to uh, keep it um, just, I mean, that is an important, you know, if you've written a story that a lot of people read, then you know that it was a good story. Um, but we try to pick topics that yeah. have nothing to do yeah, with, you've got with a the number numbers. There. I know you but, have a number there. <laughs> well, so. Come on, come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so. Uh, I think a typical month at Quanta now is like a million uniques, okay. um, and that, but then a, a story might take off, and mm -hmm. then that story might have mm -hmm. a million uniques. Right, and so Quanta has distribution agreements with other publications, Wired, uh, The Atlantic, yeah, and such, and and so have, there's a kind yeah. of megaphone effect. Yeah, and th those probably have, um, uh -huh. you know, uh, mm -hmm. get more eyeballs on the mm -hmm. story than, than we do at our site, or maybe a, sometimes about the same. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Sabina, you've come to this now as a kind of hybrid. Um, uh, you are, you know, a, a, a working physicist, and you are also uh, occasionally reaching out as a freelancer to write for the very publications that um, uh, Natalie and I were just sort of talking about. Now, I wonder, when you decide to do that, how do you see yourself? I mean, do you see yourself as, um, as many science communicators do, as the sort of cheerleader of all that's good and perfect about uh, uh, the research that you're engaged in? Do you see yourself as a, as a challenging journalist? I mean, what's your role when you reach out as a, as a writer, as a freelancer, for one of these publications? Uh, changes by the day. <laughs> changes by the day. So um, when I write for some magazine or so, I don't write about my own research, of course. I uh, usually try to write about something that's far enough so that I can pretend I'm objective about it. <laughs> um, when I write on my blog, it's um, fairly often it's something critical about my own field or related field. Uh, which I think is a topic that is not sufficiently much uh, covered uh, by the usual magazines. They are, as you say, in most cases, very cheerful about, you know, what's new and what's great, and everything is always great, you know. It's mm -hmm. always a great breakthrough, great breakthrough 
and uh, it's groundbreaking, it's novel. You know, th these are the words that uh, you use. Um, so I, I guess I do a little bit of everything. No, you got to you got to tell us more. A little bit of everything. <laughs> How do you decide when you're going to do a blog post versus pitch Thank you. something or Thank do you. a music video? Yeah. Or yeah. You're you have a you have a, a a more than usual collection of tools at your disposal, Sabina. You sing. You do cartoons. You blog. Um, you apparently have like the energy and focus to not only sort of conduct your research but to actually write like a, what sounds like a quite wonderful and challenging book for the general public. How do you decide as a scientist who is now going to reach out, how do you pick your medium? How do you pick your, your voice, if you like? Well, the first line decision is um, how much, what's the time window? You know, if it's window? something that I want to get out uh, very quickly, I'll use my blog. Just because if I pitch it somewhere and um, then there will be several weeks delay and then there, there will be more delay until it appears and so on. So um, say there's something like um, uh, two years ago I was at this conference um, in Stockholm where Stephen Hawking was there and he gave some talk about some new development. Okay, so and um, well, I was sitting in the audience and I had my laptop there, right? <laughs> and uh, so behind me, there were t 10 people from the, from the Stockholm press sitting, <laughs> recording the whole thing. Uh, and I knew they would have to uh, go back and type it up and put it on their website. Uh, and I was sitting there and was just writing it and uh, while he was speaking, and so I was the first who could get it out. Um, that's because I had no one to pass through. It was just my thing. And uh, there are uh, similar instances when I'm at a conference or when I uh, hear a seminar by someone and uh, I know I can be the first one to get this out. Um, so, so that's when I will use the blog. Um, I, I kind of think that's what, what blogs were meant for. And so now if on the other hand I see that there's a general a big development going on in the community where I feel uh, people are rethinking something and this might be a bigger thing, I might go and pitch the story because it might be of broader interest because it can be put into context into the big picture. Um, so hmm. for example, so, so that's, that's a way to make decisions. Natalie, how do you pick your topics? I mean. The foundation-based model is increasingly common in, in journalism, at least in the US. Mm -hmm. um, but it sort of comes with all these kind of frown-making worry things about like, well, is the funder exercising undue influence over the content or is the content somehow dictated by the grant uh, giving operation that foundations, and certainly the Simon Foundation does. I mean, so one, do you have anybody looking over your shoulder in that way when you choose um, a topic to write? And, and how, do you, how do you arrive at, at mm -hmm. what you're going to pay attention to? Yeah, um, well, so we are editorially independent from the foundation. Um, we are, our areas of coverage are, I guess, mirror the areas that the Simons Foundation funds. So that's the way in which we uh, I guess are connected. You know, th there's physics, math, biology, and certain you know quantitative or theoretical biology more. So, um, but within those subjects, it's there's no oversight at all about what we cover. And in fact, um, sometimes it's actually a problem because the the, um, the sim that we're connected to the foundation because the foundation does fund so much. Mm -hmm. really important research in physics and math and we try to avoid covering things that they funded and so you kind of run into occasions where you'd really like to cover something but it feels a bit too close to or, or it feels that the foundation is too involved in it and that we have to. Oh, so it actually works the other way. It's yeah, like, sometimes. Oh, yeah. No, I'm going mean, gonna, gonna, gonna we'll to pass on a good story because I don't want to look like a shill yeah, for the foundation. Yeah, hmm. but we can also just put a disclaimer, but we try not to do that too often. Um, 
So in terms of story selection, I mean, um, I think that to me that's the hardest part about being a journalist is just knowing what to cover because once you decide you're going to um, invest like a few weeks in mm -hmm. a story, I mean, that, that's a huge investment of time mm -hmm. and, um, and you can only do so many in a year and so, mm -hmm. um, you know, which ones do you pick? Right, right, so, so which ones do you pick? I yeah. know where she gets her ideas. She's sitting listening to Stephen Hawking, which <laughs> is not a bad way. What do you do? Um, so, I, I feel like uh, I, nev I mean, I never know where my next story is coming from. It's always, it always feels like a bit of a crapshoot, just uh -huh. um, keeping your ears to the ground and just um, things come up. But t typical ways are going to conferences and, or, or going to, um, even if you're not at the conference, looking at the listings of what okay. What's your favorite conference? There. What's your favorite conference? Oh, um, what's your most productive conference? You know, I, yeah, I don't really, I, yeah. I don't have one. Yeah. I feel like every time I go to a conference, I feel like, oh, this is not working out. Like, I'm not finding any stories. This is terrible. And then maybe, like, two stories will come out of it later. Or something I saw will turn into a story, like, two years later, because I remember and then follow up on it. So. Um, but I find going to conferences actually to be a very unpleasant experience, but <laughs> it's something you have to do. Unpleasant, um, unpleasant how or why? Uh, just that feeling of being in a talk and being like, oh, this isn't worth my time. How do I get out of here? Like, go to the <laughs> talk. <laughs> um, yeah, and all the awkwardness, the standing around, and yeah, it's, but it's necessary. And I also like to go to talks around the city, too. We have... NYU and Columbia with great physics departments and then Princeton nearby. So, mm -hmm. um, and then also like Twitter blogs. I mean, you know, I've gotten stories from Peter's blog before um, and other people's, you know, just picking up on, um, yeah, but I will say, I think the main uh, or the other main way other than conferences is um, just talking to sources a lot. So like emailing with people and saying, hey, mm. what's going on in your area? Are mm -hmm. there any new papers that you're excited about? Um, and, uh, and then when you're doing an interview for a story you're already working on, asking people what else is going on that mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. you are excited about. So you get ideas from his blog. Every once in a while. Okay. So, yeah. Sabina, you blog, and I know uh, <laughs> and a, your, and your blog, and a significant percentage of your readers are, in fact, science journalists who are, you know, picking through your posts looking for good story ideas. Does that irritate you? Um, <laughs> I mean, we're, we're ripping you it's off. Not, uh, I, I know that a lot of people who read my blog are science writers. Uh, I, I know a fair amount of them. At some point, you get to meet them most of the time. Um, it, it's fine by me. I mean, I think that's kind of what uh, blogs were meant for, uh, to some extent. What irritates me as a scientist is that you rarely get the credit for it. Um, so in, uh, in science, like the most important thing that you can do is that you cite your sources. You, you give credit to, hmm. the, to the people who, um, on whose work uh, you built. And in, in science writing, that's just not a thing. Sure. You, you dwell in a culture of credit, essentially, whereas we dwell We're in a culture throat. of <laughs> borrowing and absorbing, and, and I think the nice word is repurposing, you know? <laughs> so, you know, Sabina, you've written that journalists often make science and physics in particular seem much too easy. Uh, <laughs> you know, somebody scribbles something on a board, they scratch their head, and wow, there it is, three paragraphs, and then we go into explaining how it happened. Um, and that that actually is misleading <coughs> to readers um, who may interpret our analogies too literally. Um, how, do, how do you suggest we, Im we improve that? Help us out here. Well, one of the problems that I have with a lot of um, popular science writing um, is that it doesn't give the reader a good idea for what is actually going on. 
So uh, a quanta, quanta magazine, by the way, is uh, one of those exce exceptions, I, I think, because um, you're not afraid to really explain the technical stuff without using the technical words. Um, uh, I don't know, maybe that actually puts up off some readers, uh, but I, I think it's really uh, necessary um, because uh, a lot of people, um, if, if, you, if you dump it down too much, they get used to it. <laughs> you know, um, and I think that websites um, offer a good way to circumvent the problem that too many readers might jump off. And uh, I think you do this to some extent um, with with the graphics that uh, you yeah. have. I, I really like the format uh, of the website. Is that you can have a text which uh, gives you a general idea of what's going on, but also allow uh, the reader to learn more. Um, you know, to say, mm -hmm. you know, you can also look at this and there are some more details and um, if you really want to know, here are the technical terms and uh, maybe there's some further reading here so that people are not just stuck with this little bite of information, mm -hmm. you know, some, some uh, catchy mm -hmm. uh, headline and then some image that has nothing to do with the body of the text, you know, the, the typical uh, website stuff. Um, because uh, online you can, you can really address uh, readers with different levels of knowledge by giving them the option to choose how much they want to know. Hmm. And, uh, but that's something that's very hard to do in print. A question? Mm -hmm. We have a question. Someone who wants to know. Go ahead. So physics and mathematics are much more inherently quantitative than a lot of other sciences. And I was wondering what some of the strategies that both of you yeah use to make it more accessible to people who might only remember basic arithmetic? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, yeah. Natalie, why don't you uh, start it off? Sure. Um, so strategy. How deep, how deep do you have to dive? Yeah. How concerned are you about losing people as you actually mm -hmm. embrace the material? Um, I definitely think I have to dive pretty deep. Uh, in the reporting phase, and you know, sometimes that means actually reading the papers, um, but usually it means just doing a, a ton of interviews and maybe going back to the sources and interviewing them again and again until I feel like I really understand something, um, and and then and then having to really really scale back and or, or find the kind of bones of the explanation within that kind of huge amorphous mass of information and, and build them up into the skeleton of the explanation. So I think um, in terms of strategies for how to explain things, I mean, um, I think people often, when they're reporting on something really technical, um, if, if they don't understand it very well themselves, they just kind of throw in a lot of details that they've been told and uh, mm -hmm. kind of just add the jargon in and hope that it all together kind of seems like an explanation, but it actually is just obscuring the fact that they didn't know which details were the important ones. And I think it's really important to, um, to figure that out first and, and pair everything else away and get rid of all the jargon and just construct what, what feels like a cause and effect relationship between like some mechanism and the, the you know, some sequence of mechanisms that gets you to Can you give thing. us an example? Um, hmm. Uh, well, so with some of the more technical stories that, um, that I've done, or subjects that I've written about, um, like some examples that come to mind, I mean, one that probably maybe people here would have heard of is the amplitohedron. Um, which oh, yeah, okay, who's heard of that? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Maybe I should okay. ask it the other way, but I think we can tell that okay. we actually have a fairly good cross section here. So yeah, go ahead. So um, the, this amplitohedron is this geometric object where um, simple way to put it is that the volume of this object um, in, encodes the outcomes of what happens when you collide particles together. So when you collide particles, many, you know, there's um, many different outcomes and 
the probabilities of when you get which outcome um, are encoded in this structure. And so this is a discovery of the past few years, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of patterns like this that are being found, and um, and it's all extremely math heavy. And I mean, you look at these papers, and they look like you know some kind of alien script. Like it doesn't even make any sense. Like these images, and um, but. And yet, this is one of the most popular, art I think it's actually the most popular quanta article. Um, it's even still, really? this was like four years ago, and today it popped up on our like most read list again. So it, it constantly gets found and read, and it's because people are very interested in this idea that there's this geometry that underlies physical reality, that this picture that we have of particles colliding within space-time um, that of things moving in space and time are actually uh, just realizations of some geometric structures. And so this is obviously extremely technical. It took a long time for me to understand um, anything about this work. And I, uh, I, I just, I was really lost at sea in this story for so long. And, um, but when you read the story now, I think it seems pretty logical and simple and like anyone could understand it, I think. And so, um, and it involves kind of sequences of, of uh, you know, it, narrative, right? Um, finding the initial point where that was sort of the beacon that something might like this might exist and then people discovered along the way, st steps that eventually led to yeah. the I, I, I want to dig into this for a minute, I mean, kind of generically. Because, um, as, as, as I think you know, recently in the kind of science journalism community, there's been a, a mild kerfluffle where, uh, uh, through uh, uh, some blog posts that were being, um, I think, sort of dismissive is a nice word, uh, dismissive of the idea of paying any attention whatsoever in public to things like physics because it is in fact so impenetrable that any right-thinking science journalist would run screaming in the other direction because it is so boring. So when people like that, and maybe I include myself in that some days, um, when you were trying to explain that to us, you talk, you talk with your hands, right? Oh, yeah. When journalists talk right with their hands, they talk with their hands, and what they do often is in lieu of understanding, they substitute metaphor and simile and analogy. And, and I'm kind of wondering what the two of you think of that. I mean, when, and, and by that I mean, you know, we don't tell you what space time sort of is. We don't really kind of work it out. We tell you it's, and I'm quoting now a very prominent and popular and widely admired science journalist who shall remain nameless for the moment, um, but admired for that space time is the ultimate sagging mattress, you know, which is a great phrase, but like, what does it mean? Or, or that, um, uh, elementary particles derive mass from the Higgs boson, the way politicians draw succor from cheers and handshakes at the rope line. Um, or in, uh, in my personal uh, favorite overreach, um, uh, in discussing the collision of dense dead stars, which was a headline making thing just a few weeks ago. Um, quote, all the atoms in your wedding band, in the Pharaoh's treasures and the bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and still threaten us all, so the story goes, have been formed in cosmic gong shows that reverberated across the heavens. Now, on the one hand, that is beautiful, right? But do any of you derive understanding from that? Could you walk away and take a physics test and say, you know, I could at least get that multiple choice one because Sabina or Natalie explained it to me clearly. I mean, do you, when you look at the work of your colleagues and your peers, um, and you're free to make fun of me, I mean, um, do you find that, that we're um, uh, preventing understanding, not facilitating it? That's a question. You can start, and uh, Sabina, you're uh, looking sure. like you've got an idea that's percolating there, so I want to get it from you too, but you start, Natalie. Yeah, I, mean, I think some, so I, I know who you're talking about and enjoy that kind of description. Um, and I think sometimes, like that sagging mattress image, I think is very uh, explanatory. 
Um, but other times, obviously, it does, metaphors do just cloud the, what could be a much clearer explanation or make people feel that, um, that they want just the straightforward, clearer explanation that you, they don't want you to just try to kind of um, keep them in more familiar territory. So I think it can be one or the other. Um, I think you can't overuse metaphors because they're just distracting or you know, someone's like, this is a metaphor. It's just, you don't want to always be thinking that as you're reading something. Um, I think sometimes, so I prefer turns of phrases to metaphors. Like I, I don't hmm. want to bring in a new noun or object and say, okay, don't think about like a particle, think about a bowling ball or something. I would rather just use the language um, and familiar, evocative language, um, but stick with the things that we're really talking about. I want to hear from Sabina, and then I'm going to get your question. Mm -hmm. Sabina, how do you feel about sort of the use or, or misuse of metaphor analogies and such uh, in trying to describe very complex and sometimes, you know, quite ineffable um, uh, phenomena in, in contemporary physics? I don't a priori have a problem with the use of metaphors and analogies. I think to some extent um, it's unavoidable um, if you try to convey the content of rather complicated mathematics uh, in, in words. Um, problems start to appear when um, people confuse the metaphor for the real thing. So uh, if, if it's not really clear to them uh, in that, that it's a metaphor or where it uh, stops being accurate um, and, and then they take it too seriously. So I, I've certainly uh, encountered this a lot. Um, on the other hand, one also has to say that y you had all these nice quotes. Um, the people who write these things, they are writers. They like words, right? I mean, that's what they do for a living. And I can't blame them for it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I know, I know where it's come from. You know, you, you, you have a sentence and it just, it sounds perfect. You know, it's a great sentence. Uh, y you want to get it out there. Um, though sometimes it would be better to just use a very clear, though boring phrase. Um, but I also have to add that a lot of people just, they like to read nice sounding things. So I don't uh, necessarily see something wrong with it. I, I think it speaks to a certain audience. We have a question here. Sure, I mean, you brought up LIGO, gravitational waves, and I think a lot of us really enjoy reading about them. With a little bit more news recently, maybe not so little, uh, about two smaller solar mass or lower solar mass, black holes colliding earlier this week, I think. What, if, what, what can we look forward to maybe with LIGO? Should we be focusing more on LIGO? I guess it depends on what they you know, discover in the future, but I'm trying to think, should we just keep following that story? Uh, you know, how big is it? What more might we anticipate from, from that observatory? Sabina, do you think that the, the LIGO effort is the most important story in physics now? From your perspective, of course. Depends on how you rate importance. I'm I asking mean, you to rate it's importance. Certainly, um, I think it's probably what presently attracts the most public attention. Right. Um, and there's certainly more to come from LIGO. Um, for, for me, the most uh, interesting aspect is that um, if they see more events, they get better statistics, they will be able to tell us more about what kinds of systems are out there, um, how they are distributed. Um, one thing that's peculiar about the events that I have seen so far, for example, is all that all the black holes seem to be much heavier than what people expected. Um, and so that, that's a real puzzle. Um, it's also tangentially relevant to what I'm working on myself, um, mostly quantum gravity, because in certain scenarios, the gravitational waves actually carry some information about uh, what goes on with the quantum fluctuations of space-time. Hmm. Um, so um, it, it's a big thing, and it's it's brand new, 
Uh, there are a lot of things that are totally unexplored that people are only now starting to investigate. So it's, it's definitely very exciting. And you feel the same? Yeah, I do. Uh, I, I um, prefer the fundamental questions in physics. Um, and so I think I, I, I love LIGO and I was really excited about uh, these gravitational wave discoveries um, because it was amazing that humans could do what we did and detect such tiny signals. Um, and just uh, this, un uh, this feeling of that humans um, know what happened a billion years ago to these invisible objects is amazing. And it gives you just this feeling of deep satisfaction. Um, so the first discovery, amazing. Neutron star merger, really interesting for different reasons. But as we get into the just further um, you know, additional black hole collision discoveries, uh, I don't feel interested in reporting on individual s discoveries anymore, basically, at this point. And what will be interesting is when there are enough statistics that they're actually able to use the statistics to say something definitive. Um, and so I guess, but getting back to what I said about the fundamental thing, you know, I think um, I'm sure it's true that eventually black hole mergers will touch on quantum gravity or, um, you know, maybe. And if we build LISA, this much bigger gravitational wave detector that will be in space, um, that could maybe see, well, actually, I don't know if that could see primordial gravitational waves, but if we detected primordial gravitational waves from the Big Bang, that would be very fundamental. Um, but LIGO, the, the black hole mergers that they detect um, are not going to tell us about, they're, they're not necessarily going to uh, advance the edge of, of physics um, itself. It's more astrophysics. And so, uh, yeah, so I, I feel kind of, you know, not just over the moon by every new collision at this point, to be diplomatic. I thought that was very nice, <laughs> very thoughtfully, and very diplomatic. Sir. Hi. Yeah, um, I wanted to ask about, I mean, I think physics especially is really, you know, it's so cumulative. You know, you have to understand certain things about, you know, Newtonian mechanics to get into relativity and certain things about what atoms are made of to talk about particle physics. And so, you know, you talked before about how deeply you dive into your explanations of the new results. You know, how do you decide what context and background to assume of your audience mm. and how do you make that decision? I mean, for example, the, you know, the three metaphors you just read, in some sense, all of them have, you know, merit to them, but they're all kind of inside jokes, right? They're all referencing kind of metaphors that have been well trodden, right? And so, yeah, how do you make that decision? Hmm. Um, Sabina, are you, are you, uh, I'm okay. still awake. <laughs> yeah, are you with us? <laughs> well, it, it depends w for, for whom I write, for which uh, medium. Uh, so typically if I write on my blog, I assume a much higher background just because I know that a lot of people who read the blog um, are uh, students or my colleagues. Uh -huh. So um, a fair share of them actually do have um, at least a master's degree, if not a PhD in physics. Not necessarily in, in the same field, um, but uh, in, in a closely related uh -huh. one. Um, That's a pretty rarefied readership, if you're just reaching out to a community of physics PhDs. Is that your intent? Well, no, not only, uh, but um, I, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, a certain, a, a significant fraction of them yeah. um, know a lot. And uh, so in a, in a certain sense, that means that uh, I can never do it right, you know. It's either I get complaints because uh, people don't understand what I write, or I get complaints because I haven't explained enough. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, if I write uh, for um, some magazine that um, aims at a larger public, uh, I certainly don't add that many technical details. Mm. Natalie? Yeah, I try not to assume any background in hmm. uh, in physics, but I think uh, 
you know, if you really know absolutely nothing, then you're probably going to have a hard time understanding like, some of our articles. Um, but like, you'd have to go really slow. Um, but you should be able to do it. You should be able to, you know, if you read it a few times, then mm -hmm. you should be able For to get it. a few times, yeah. Because yeah. even the subjects of your work, see, I wonder what kind of filter system is operating here. I mean, I appreciate the clarity with which you write, but of course, the topics that you're writing on, uh, sphere, pack, sphere packing problems or dark disk theory or uh, the thing that you two have in common, I think, the end of naturalness in physics, whatever, are not... Um, sort of the currency of street conversations uh, or uh, Starbucks uh, yik yaks. This is uh, beginning, you know, um, with the hard stuff and then going deeper. So I wonder, you know, along that question, how do you decide, you know, given that you're already starting somewhat submerged in the specialty? How do you bring the rest of us along? Well, or do you care? Yeah, well, I, I definitely Maybe you were not there for the care. ride. Maybe no, no, no maybe yeah. I mean, I, I would, it would be great if people were talking about naturalness at the bar because <laughs> it's super interesting. I mean, I do. I mean, <laughs> like, um, and I, but I, I feel like these topics actually are extremely interesting to anyone. And uh, whenever I'm thinking about how to get into a story, um, I try to make it clear what the big overarching question is um, that the scientists are so passionately trying to answer. And usually that, that question is fascinating in its own right. Like um, if you clearly explain what the tension or uh, question is, I think most people can't, you can hook a lot more people than might be expected, but it's just setting up the story in a way where you, the reader, immediately knows like what they're trying to figure out. Um, yeah. Another question. So uh, I have a two-part question, basically related to the previous question. And do you think there are negatives uh, when you're writing to a large audience and you're not diving into the formulas and math behind uh, discovery in physics? And do you think? Uh, the background and nuts and bolts understanding of the mathematics will be less important in scientific literature going forward. Uh, the reason I believe that second part is because in general needing to have everybody understand something less, there's more point and click ways to solve problems. Uh, but basically, uh, what are the negatives of not diving into the math and do you think it will always be important to understand the underlying math behind the discoveries? Sabina, what do you um, if you really want to understand what uh, goes on uh, in physics, you need the math. Uh, there is just no way around it. Um, but I have found it possible to communicate at least the reasoning uh, behind the research by uh, even though I'm leaving out the mathematics. It has actually been an interesting exercise. I, I used to think that it just wasn't possible um, because you, if, if you don't know the math, if you don't know how these things behave, you, you cannot really understand um, the idea behind it. But um, the attempt to leave out the math when I'm writing um, has taught me that it's often necessary to look at the big picture. So typically when I write a story for my blog or for um, some, some other outlet about a rather technical problem, I will uh, go and read the literature uh, and try to understand the logic behind it. And the story that I write in the end uh, will just say, okay, so here's the problem that people tried to solve and that's the motivation and that's why it's important. And then the magic math happens. <laughs> okay, so that's the part that I leave out and the result is blah, 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 blah. And, and that's what we learn from it. And then usually I add something like, um, maybe I believe it or I don't believe it, or maybe it's, I think it's relevant or it's not relevant to so some personal uh, opinion. And um, from that, I learned a lot um, how to not get distracted by the math. 
because I find a lot of um, people who work on this stuff, they get very carried away by just being able to calculate something. Hmm. And uh, they no longer see really what is going on. Um, and that, that's basically why my book is titled Lost in Math. Lost in Math, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is mostly, <laughs> sorry for the self-advertisement, it's, no, no. it, it's mostly about naturalness, which uh, you seem to think is uh, so some obscure thing that uh, is not really all that relevant, but it's, uh, it's, it's a really a big thing right now in the particle physics community, mm -hmm. this discussion about well, is nature natural? I, yeah. I know it's, it sounds uh, a little bit strange, but that's, that's the discussion. Um, I, sh I should insert here, because I want to, let's linger on this for a minute, but I think you've just kind of like pinpointed like this, this issue that I'm, I'm happy we're talking about. I quite understand that the discussion over naturalness in physics is probably, you know, one of the two or three most pressing questions in physics, and I can guarantee you that very few people in this audience have heard of it. They've heard of the multiverse. Maybe. They have heard of the multiverse. <laughs> Somewhat related. Right, right. But that's only because of, you know, DC comics and, and, uh, and uh, movies, you know. Well, I guess that oh, they, please, they, continue, have, they please. have probably uh, implicitly heard of it because uh, I guess most of you have heard that physicists were fairly confident that the LHC would see something besides the Higgs. LHC, right, that's Large what, Hadron that's what Collider. We've been told um, there would be supersymmetric particles, there would be dark matter candidates, maybe large extra dimensions or tiny black holes, and all that fancy stuff. Uh, none of which you ever heard anything about, right? Why didn't this happen? Well, it didn't happen because this assumption that nature has to be natural in a specific te technical way um, was just wrong. So all these smart people, they were all wrong. And that bothers some of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they don't, but they're not required to give back their Nobel Prizes. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, they found yeah, yeah, the Higgs, no, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but that, was not, that was not based on this idea of naturalness. Th well, that no, was a safe bet. But the supersymmetry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And th that's one of the examples. Um, and so, so I, I think that even though you might not have um, heard exactly what naturalness is, um, naturalness was the reason why they believed there should be something more. Mm -hmm. Natalie? Yeah, I, I think you, I see your point completely. Uh, it's this really big, important subject and actually uh, it seems like, I mean, it, it's not that complicated to explain, but um, yeah, most people don't know about it because it's more about um, kind of how physics works or how things should fit together within physics rather than like a particle or some concrete like mm -hmm. object that we're talking about. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so it's harder to get across. To Does it also people. not sort of fit, journalists like to tell stories, like to construct narratives, and, and a lot of m knowledge in physics is not a narrative story of characters doing cool things and having emotional interactions. I mean, it is, of course, but in terms of trying to make people understand the physics itself. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think narratives can exist without, without people. The, the stars of a narrative can be ideas more, you know, more than people, but, um, and there are people involved in this story oh, no. also of, of naturalness, but, um, but yeah, it's, it is harder, yeah. I mean, I, I think over time, over the years, I've definitely gotten better at quickly explaining naturalness um, because I've had to do it a lot of times. And, um, but that, yeah, that's been a process for sure. And I have to, at this point, make sure I'm not like self-plagiarizing because ah, now yeah. I, there's like yeah. specific words that I like to say. You have your stock metaphors and your yeah. three favorite analogies. <laughs> we have a yeah. question here. So my question is that um, I, I think I do think that people would read this if it was presented in a way that was available to the general public. So I guess as a thought exercise to you, I ask, what would you do if you had to write about the naturalness problem or any advanced physics topic to an audience of maybe high schoolers or you know 
liberal arts college students and you had like five to 600 words for an outlet like, you know, the New York hmm. Times or for any outlet like that? Yeah. No, I think you could definitely do it. I mean, um, I've done a few like longer stories that are about naturalness um, because of, they'll be like, there's some new development basically like, oh, we didn't find supersymmetry again. So here's another story where we talk about how, what this means. Um, but if it was just a post on here's what the problem is and uh, here, or here's the big question and the crisis, um, I think you could definitely do that for a high schooler easily. Yeah. And I think they would be very interested. I mean, that's th this is the whole problem, right? It's like people are really interested in these things when they have exposure to them and when it's, um, when it's all uh, done correctly. But there's, I think a lot of people have been burned by trying to read a story and um, a, a science article and it's bad or it, it just is off-putting in some way. And then like, oh, I guess I don't like science or I don't like science journalism. Um, but yeah, I think that's a problem. Sabina, what advice would you give? Many of us here are, are students. We're, we're uh, gifted with degrees in one science or another, so we're not um, complete idiots about technical matters. But what advice would you give to a, a journalist who was coming to one of these stories for the first time, was encountering, I mean, pick something, uh, not gravitational waves or or something that comes uh, accompanied by a large um, public relations effort. But, but uh, how would you get your start as a physics reporter? What would you advise? Well, generally, I guess I would advise them to uh, not exactly start with the technical papers. <laughs> That's uh, not, not the best thing to do. Um, Nowadays, you have a great resource at your hand with recorded lectures, which are in many cases much easier to digest than the papers, especially if you can find public lectures. Uh, that's, that's a good place to start. And um, as Natalie alre already said, you know, talk to the people. Um, some of them are actually pretty good at explaining their stuff. Um, it's just that if you look at the uh, published literature, people are more or less forced to uh, really put in all the technical terms uh, and so on and so forth. So that, that's just not a good place to start with, even though at some point it's almost unavoidable that, that you get to, um, I mean, I, I don't really know why you're asking me what journalists should do. Uh, shouldn't you ask her? <laughs> well, because in a minute I'll ask Natalie what scientists should do. Um, well, I was asking you what students should do, um, what beginners should do, uh, people who are coming to this for the first time. And I think uh, your particular uh, stature as a science read communicator. Blogs. Read blogs. Read blogs. <laughs> there you go. Read her blog. Natalie, what advice would you give? Um, I, one thing is, I think, to start small um, with just writing shorter pieces on kind of bite-sized topics. Uh, so, what's a bite-sized topic I in guess, your world? Um, reporting on a an individual paper, for example, rather than a whole trend or a whole like uh, crisis or um, debate going on in the field. So, so more like here's a, a study comes out and then figure out how to, how to present that to a general audience. So um, I think it takes time to kind of get to the point where you, you're like ready, for sure this was true for me, before you're ready to write like a multi-thousand word story because there's just so many things that have to happen in it. And um, even even that really long story is really a bunch of shorter stories that are pieced together in the right way. And it can just be too overwhelming, I think, for a beginning writer. Um, so that's one piece of advice. Um, another thing is, in terms of actually getting started with understanding the physics, I mean, I think 
I don't know what it would be like to come from the journalism side and enter physics writing that way. I feel like it would be really scary. And I mean, is that, that's what you did. So it's I mean, really scary. Yeah. It's very uh, scary. <laughs> and that's why we like particle physics so much, because it's about like things we can conceive of knocking yeah. heads or stuff. And, yeah. and some of the things that are you all have been talking about are, are very foggy, because yeah. they not they don't have the, uh, the appearance of being tangible. And they, people like me who come to science and to physics through journalism, this is, this is very, uh, it's beyond thin ice. It's like you're walking on fog. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, so some of us are students, but some of us are also uh, here are scientists who are interested in doing, uh, Sabina, what you do, um, which is to say reach out and various ways to the general public, not just to a peer review community. Um, so Natalie, I'm wondering what advice you'd give to scientists. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing is just being willing to talk to science journalists. I mean, I think uh, there, for example, after the BICEP2 disaster where they these scientists came out and said, we discovered primordial gravitational waves, the echo of the Big Bang, had this big press conference, front page stories on every newspaper, and then a few months later, it all went up in smoke or dust. dust. It was all, dust, yeah. um, they were actually looking at a signal from dust in the Milky Way. So, um, and then after that, uh, the, the group who did, who, it was really their fault, I think, they, just decided that they were no longer going to talk to journalists as if it was the fault of the journalists. And even, I think, a lot of other groups um, or scientists in the same general subject matter had this sense that it was ju the journalist's fault. And you could really sense a change then with people not wanting to talk to us. Um, and so I think, you know, being willing to to spend the time is really important. Um, but then a lot of scientists are, are more than generous with their time, and I'm actually amazed a lot of the time like how people are willing to continue asking my questions after you'd think they would have long told me to get lost. Um, so other advice? Um, but if they want to write, if they want to oh yeah, if they want to write, you know, sure. tell stories of their own. Tell it themselves, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think, yeah, starting a blog is a great idea. Uh, I think people who have blogs um, tend to have like a, almost an outsized influence on the community. Um, if you were basing their influence, you know, on their their research and present company excluded, it, but just in general, um, there's researchers who kind of, um, you know, their their own work isn't necessarily so important but their blog is really important, so they're quite well known, um, and what they say really matters. So blogging can be a, a really great tool, and it's useful for people like me. Um, and in terms of how to explain things well to people who, uh, you know, who don't, aren't familiar with your subject matter, I mean, reading a lot is a good place to start. You know, re reading a lot of um, reading books you. that are reading you. written well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, emulating how other people yeah. do it. Um, it's one thing. Uh -huh. We have a question here. Hello, this is an excellent question from the Canadian scientist Dennis Gilbert. And he says, my question is for Sabine. In addition to the hard science and math, your writing contains a healthy dose of humor, spelled with a U. Do you have a special recipe about the amount of humor to intersperse with the more technical explanations? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you want it in percent? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think pounds and ounces. <laughs> um, no, I don't know. Actually, I, I don't think I'm particularly witty. <laughs> no? <laughs> Um, so, I, I'm, I'm afraid I don't really have anything smart to say about it. Um, 
humor is difficult, you know. I r read a lot of popular science book with jokes in them and I don't like it. <laughs> I, have, I have tried really hard to not make jokes in my book because I think uh, humor is a very personal thing. Uh, and it's also different between uh, different cultures. Uh, you know, I think that uh, for, uh, American humor is very, very different from German humor. It's very different from British humor uh, and so on. So, I, uh, you know, I'm happy that the person likes my type of humor, but I'm pretty sure there are many people who think it's pretty um, nauseous. <laughs> <laughs> so I usually try to avoid it. I guess sometimes I just can't help myself. So, I just have to check. Are you trying to be funny, or is <laughs> somebody finding no, you funny? No, I. <laughs> um, I'm. I'm not really sure what the person was referring to. So, how am I supposed to know? Yeah. It's well. I um, mean, in you know, part, sometimes Sabina, I, I guess you know, sometimes I'm just Natalie I'm, I'm and I just kind of write. You know, I mean, we're text people, and you know, we'll take photographs and graphics and things. But you really are covering the map. I mean, you're, you're not tap dancing, but all but, you know. Um, you have tried a lot of different things, and you have uh, put yourself out there as an explicator in a variety of um, possibly humorous ways, you know. I mean, do you, do you feel grim when you're doing an animation? Um, do you uh, feel subsumed with seriousness when you're singing about Schrodinger's cat? I mean, please, share with us. We won't tell. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of the stuff that I write about probably seems uh, funny to people who read it because it is funny, but not because I make it funny, but because it is funny, period. You look at what's going on in the community. Like, if, for example, as I said earlier, um, now Chris has come to the conclusion that nature isn't natural. I, I, you know, it, it sounds funny, but it's true. I don't even have to make a lot of effort. And uh, it's uh, similar to this, like when, I, um, when I'm critical of the community, I don't um, have to um, make a lot of effort to make jokes about it. I just tell it how it is, and people laugh. <laughs> um, and... Um, I'm not always happy that they laugh. Uh, sometimes I'm outright embarrassed about uh, what's going on in my community. It's been observed. He's still not sure if I'm joking or not. <laughs> <laughs> it's been observed that there are styles of storytelling in different um, scientific specialties, I guess. And that um, in um, uh, a number of disciplines, reporters use the research as kind of raw materials for short stories, almost kind of fictional narratives. And by fictional, I don't mean made up, but I mean little kind of adventure stories about people going in the lab and hunting whales and bringing them back. And, and it's, it's very entertaining. Um, and in the course of the entertainment, there may be some, uh, often maybe quite a lot of, of information about science or the scientific process in this particular field communicated. But it's very uh, much, uh, uh, it could be a, you know, a story about a designer preparing a fashion show or whatever, but it just happens to be these are scientists doing their thing. But it appears to be sort of a style of writing about physics to be earnestly and indefatigably explanatory, hmm. like almost tutorial. Uh, and, and I admire your work, for instance, but it has that thread. Um, rarely are you telling, you do, do profiles occasionally, but not as a research profile. You're like, you're, you, just, you just want me to understand what the heck is going on here. <laughs> Now that's kind of an interesting stylistic difference. I sort of wonder why you think that is. Are you just more earnest than the rest of us, or what is it? Uh, I mean, I, I guess I 
think that the ideas are really interesting and that um, it is really satisfying to understand them at the level uh, that the researchers actually do. Um, to, to have that feeling that you, and not the math, but the concepts, the implications of the concepts and of the findings, um, to be right at the edge of knowledge and to be able to think about the different you know, considerations or perspectives and decide for yourself like how you think about something. Like um, getting to, taking a reader along to that point so they're kind of right there with the researchers and um, feel that they have a stake in whatever happens next. Uh, that, that's what I want to provide and that obviously does require some explanation to get to get there. Um, but I also think, you know, I mean, I wish that I wrote, uh, that I, um, that it didn't come across as explanatory as much as it sometimes does. Like, I think sometimes I'm able to figure out how to like wrap the explanations into the narrative more and have it be um, more like told through the person doing the work or, you know, where it doesn't feel like you're just reading paragraphs of science, but you don't always figure out how to, how to do it That's right. That's a challenge. Professor Fagan, you look like a man with a question. Yeah. Uh, it's actually a question that came in over the live stream uh, as a comment. Uh, this is from uh, Bob Sacamano, and he makes a good point. He says, regarding challenges to these big ideas in, in physics, inflation, he cites Steinhardt, Dark Matter, mm. cites Verlinde, LIGO, cites the Niels Bohr Institute. His question is, by not citing these challenges to these big ideas, do popular science authors skew public understanding? And what I would add to that is that, mm. is that the big ideas themselves are so complex to explain, so difficult to explain sometimes, that, you know, and require m metaphor, <coughs> that to, to do all that, explain them adequately, and then also uh, work in the challenges to those ideas becomes really problematic for uh, science journalists. So how do we handle mm. challenges to these big ideas when we're constrained uh, in the amount of space that we have to tell these stories? I'd like to hear you both answer that. Sabina, you wanna give that a shot? That's a very good command. Uh, and I, I think it's right that this is a big uh, problem. I think one of the reasons why, um, I, I'm guessing, why science writers often don't address these problems is that they are afraid. Mm. You know, um, since um, the person whose name I've immediately forgotten, sorry about that, um, mentioned uh, Steinhardt and his uh, criticism uh, of inflation, um, well, look at what happened to Scientific American. Right? I mean, they published this um, article by Steinhardt uh, and his collaborators, and then they get this letter from uh, 30 people, you know, some of the best known people in the field who complain that they published this thing. <laughs> um, and um, certainly similar things are going on uh, in, in the other examples when it comes to um, particle dark matter versus modified gravity. Uh, it's become a hugely political thing where the moment that you say that uh, maybe modified gravity is, you know, it might have some truth to it, and I can talk about this by itself for an hour or something, um, uh, people will stand up and start yelling at you, no, it's been ruled out long ago and we know this, which is just wrong, okay? But uh, for these uh, little small details, you know, the, the, the careful words, there's um, often no space for this. It has to be a, a simple message that comes across in a few paragraphs and there is, there is a, mm. an almost consensus, so to speak, in the community. And now uh, what's tragic about this is that is, this is a self-reinforcing loop. You know, um, the more it comes across in the media that there is an almost consensus, the more people start to believe it. Uh, and the more uh, people tell themselves the same story and the more difficult it becomes for the people um, who um, work in the smaller communities uh, to get any support, to get heard, 
Um, and I think it's, it's bad for science. And um, it's um, actually, um, uh, so I can't see anything. Where's, where's John Horgan? He's still here. Right here. Oh, you're, yeah. you're there. Uh, okay, so um, I, I would like to mention as, as, as one of the few science writers who is consistently critical about uh, what any scientist says, so he doesn't seem to like anything. <laughs> and, 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 and I think that's and, and we cherish John for that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's great. Yeah. And uh, I, but I I think a lot of science writers are just um, uh, too much cheerleaders for science, as uh, you said earlier. Uh, I I really think we need more uh, critical science writing. Yeah, I wonder how many science writers feel they have standing to be critics. Um, Natalie, do you want to address the same question for a second? Yeah, so I mean, I think what you just said is very true. Dangerous consensus. It, yeah, I, I think uh, it's hard to decide to be the one to give voice to people who the community has decided are marginal figures or wrong, um, and that you don't want to be doing that all the time because there is also a danger of um, trying to appeal to, um, you know, sensational, or, or use sensational methods like by saying, oh, this person says there is no dark matter, or this person has this like crazy idea that overturns everything that everyone believes. Like those fringe ideas, um, I think, do get their, do get some coverage. And um, so there could be pressure in that direction as well to, to cover things that are um, that just sound exciting or revolutionary, even though people in the community don't yeah, think that but, there's any. But I suggest that if anything, yeah. the problem's the other way around, don't you think? I think there's that there's they're, too they're much respect there. for uh, consensus. Yeah. Because uh, consensus is safe from a coverage standpoint, and that in fact uh, the fringe or whatever you want to call that that zone where the snap crackle and pop of new ideas is going on is in fact um, ignored because, well, it's scary and uncertain and, yeah. and big names who already have investments in existing things will write you rude right. letters. I mean, I think it's just a matter of sorting the sheep from the goats and knowing that you know, this new idea everyone actually is really excited about, or a lot of people are excited about. This new idea, people can see five reasons why it's already wrong. You know, and actually doing your research and like if something sounds too good to be true, like running it past some sources before you yeah. decide to cover it. So for you, the, the excitement is itself a kind of measure of validity. Yeah, uh, I think for me, um, even if I myself don't understand why something's exciting, um, if I can tell that it's making waves in the community, that some new paper to come out that everyone's talking about, then I might often just decide to do a story before I even really understand what it's about. Just because I can tell that whatever it is about is going to be, in the end, I'm going to see why it's exciting myself. So um, I, tr I do try to let the uh, community kind of dictate what I cover um, and, and what other people think is exciting dictate what I cover, um, but then you always want to also watch out, make sure that you're not um, just appealing to the authority figures who have a monopoly on ideas. A very quick question we can take. Sure, I just wanted to make sure I gave voice to the folks who don't have a physics background, who write for big publications or places who are scaling back their newsrooms, but still do like a pretty kick-ass job, or maybe don't, of covering the biggest things, right? So, I mean, how do you, let's say you're just regularly a biology writer, and then suddenly you get thrown the new LIGO discovery, and you want to not botch it, so what are you supposed to do? And then you, but you first. Okay. Yeah. So you've just been thrown into the shark tank. What do you do? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think you just you work really, really hard at it. Like, I mean, I feel like when I was first starting out with uh, writing, I just spent all my time like uh, working on a story. Like, I, I remember this one story that I did um, when I was an intern. And I was just working on it all the time you know, for like 
couple months. And so a couple I feel months. like in the you know in the evenings what kind like of after deadline my did you have? it was a it was like I just pitched yeah. this thing and yeah, yeah. Um, it could be whenever. But I so think I he's guess, talking about like a slightly you know yeah a sort of thing. I mean. I guess I'm just saying, I, you know, yes, that sounds like a really hard situation. You're a biology writer and you're having to write about LIGO, so you just got to work a lot, and, yeah. you know? I can, I can actually, <laughs> I, can tell you, I can tell you the dirty secret of, of, of how to handle that situation, which is when in doubt, say whatever experiment it was, proved Einstein right. <laughs> Poor guy. I mean, it's like the world's longest dissertation defense. I mean, it's, it's been 100 years and we're still like, yeah, he's right. <laughs> like, like we're surprised. But if you go look at stories about LIGO or a number of these neutron star announcements and things in recent years, you can tell who to, who's like on top of it and who isn't because they go straight to Einstein and pat him on the head. Or just say it was a provocative result, but more research is needed. <laughs> there you go. That's all there you, really you go. Need. And what has been, uh, 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 you know, a provocative uh, discussion for which uh, Sadly, more time is needed, but we are, we are out of time. And what I want to tell you is that the two of you together have helped us, I think, uh, walk through some very treacherous ground. I think this is you know, the hardest area that we confront as journalists and as science communicators because a certain percentage of us you know, don't know what we're talking about. A certain percentage of us are afraid of what we're talking about. And you two have given us the confidence to go forward. So for that, I thank you. <laughs>